Good morning. Good to be here. Good to see everyone here. Trust that all of you had a joyous Christmas and uh, thankful that you are making worship a part of your uh, remembrance of all of God's goodness today uh, as we meet together to worship and praise his name. Well, it's not only the uh, day after Christmas, it's also the last Sunday of the year, isn't it? And uh, this is a good time, I think, for us to take stock of ourselves spiritually uh, and ask ourselves, how am I doing in my spiritual growth? How am I doing in my spiritual development? Now, I don't think any of us are ever going to be entirely satisfied with our, our spiritual growth. I don't think we should be. Uh, we ought to always know that we could uh, be more in the Lord's service, do more uh, in his service. Uh, and there are always ways that we can improve. But at the same time, we ought to be able to look at our lives, particularly at the end of a whole year, and look back and see that there have been some changes. There have been some growth. There's been some improvement. There have been some things in our lives that have helped us become more like Christ and less like the world around us. You see, spiritual growth is not a condition at which we arrive. It is a process, a process in which we are engaged uh, until the Lord takes us home. We always will be. Paul says twice in the text that was read this morning that he was pressing on. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to be pressing on. But sometimes we're not pressing on, are we? Sometimes we find ourselves stuck. Uh, we don't know why, maybe. We can't really put our finger on it, but we're just not what we want to be. We're not where we ought to be spiritually, uh, not making that progress, that growth. We are not pressing on the upward way. New heights we're gaining every day. Uh, that's an aspiration, but it's not always the case. And so we want to ask ourselves, uh, what can we do about that situation? Now, the reason we're looking at Philippians chapter 3 verses 1 to 16, is that when Paul wrote this letter to this church, they were stuck. They, their spiritual growth was stifled. They were not growing in the ways that they should. Now, this was a church that Paul dearly loved. If you look at chapter 1 and again chapter 4, he talks about the Philippians sharing with him and his, his work in the gospel. Uh, I take that to mean they had offered him and given him support uh, materially. They had helped him. Uh, they were a group that he cared a great deal about. The church had started uh, with Paul going to Philippi on his second missionary journey. And the woman that we know is Lydia, the seller of purple, uh, and a jailer whose name we don't know. Uh, but they and their households were converted to Christ, and that was be the beginning of the church. And so they had this long history with Paul, and he loved them, and they apparently loved him and cared a lot about uh, about him and now that he is imprisoned and that's where he is as he's writing the letter they are helping him once again and he thanks them for that in chapter four but at the same time they're struggling they're struggling with some spiritual problems they had two things going on in the church in philippi from what we can tell from this letter one is they were not nearly as unified as they should have been they were not the unified people that God had called them to be, that he calls all of his people to be. They uh, were not uh, bound together in, in the, the bonds of fellowship as they uh, should have been. And it may have been that that stemmed from a quarrel between two ladies who are mentioned in chapter 4 and verse 2, Euodia and Syntyche. And then maybe that quarrel uh, had caused a, a, a ripples in the rest of the church, that people had taken sides. We don't really know. But something's not right. There is disunity. The other problem is with a group that are sometimes today called Judaizers. These were Jewish Christians who tried to make Jews out of Gentiles. They tried to say that the Gentiles, if they came to Christ, had to be circumcised. Uh, and so they were trying to turn them into Jews, and so they're called Judaizers. And so there's that false teaching going on. And false teaching will always create disunity. So these two problems, I think, are, are going, uh, working in tandem to create uh, problems for the church in Philippi and to stifle their spiritual growth. You know, when you don't have unity in a church, you're not going to have good spiritual growth. 
it's going to be difficult for individuals to grow spiritually. It's going to be impossible for the church to grow spiritually. And when you have false teaching, it's going to uh, keep a lot of tension in the air. It's going to keep people from being able to grow in the ways that they ought to grow. So here's a church full of people that were stuck. They didn't have the joy that they ought to have. And so Paul keeps telling them, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. He says it over and over. Fifteen times in the letter, he makes reference to joy and to rejoicing. Not because they were joyful, but because they weren't. And they desperately needed their joy restored. And their lack of joy was evidence of the fact that they were stuck spiritually. Now, Paul tries to help them in this letter to get past that point of being stuck. And the way he does it is he tells them of his own spiritual growth and his own spiritual struggles. He's very honest about it. And he tells them how he uh, has pressed on and how they need to press on. So that's what we want to think about this morning. How did Paul get himself unstuck spiritually and back on the track? And, and what do we need to do to do the same? Well, let's look at what Paul did. First of all, notice that he freely acknowledges that he has more growing to do as an apostle of Christ. He says he's not already attained the things that he wanted to attain. He's not already where he wants to be. Even though he's an apostle, he's not all, all, already there. And that's an encouragement to us because we know that's just the human condition. It's part of our uh, struggle. If you look at chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, he said he wanted to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Now, obviously, Paul already knew Christ, didn't he? He'd met him face to face on the Damascus Road. And uh, he knew Christ, but he wants to know him more. He wants to know more of Christ. And that, I think, is uh, a key to what drives spiritual growth. What drives spiritual growth is this. It is wanting a fuller experience of God. You know, if we're just satisfied with going through the motions of, of uh, worship, uh, then we're not going to grow spiritually. If we're just satisfied with reading a little bit of the Bible and saying, okay, I got that, I did my job there, did my duty, we're not going to grow spiritually. But when we want to have a fuller experience of God and we want to know him more fully and more personally, then we will grow spiritually. Ultimately, Paul said he wanted to attain the resurrection from the dead. And he didn't want to get sidetracked in that. And he wasn't sidetracked. He didn't have a lot of intermediate uh, goals, but he had that one goal of what was of first importance to him was to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and to become like him and to share in that resurrection. And so he says in verse 12 of chapter 3, not that I have already attained this or am already perfect, but he said, I'm pressing on pressing on. He's trying to uh, attain um, greater spiritual wholeness than he's ever had before in his life. And again in 3.13 he says, I do not consider that I have made it my own. That's the first step, knowing that we're not there, knowing that we need to continue pressing on. So Paul says in verse 12 and verse 14 that that's what he's doing. He's pressing on, seeking that full union with Christ. And that's so important to spiritual growth, to know that we're not all that we could be and to keep moving forward to the same goal that Paul had for himself and to let nothing get between us and that goal. Now, once Paul determined to press on, he said there, were, there was one more thing that he did. The one thing was the pressing on, but then there were two things that were part of that pressing on. And as we look at that, uh, we find out these are things that we need to do too. Here's, here's how we continue to press on. Here's how we continue in spiritual growth. Verse 12, Paul says, One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Forgetting what lies behind. Now, I want you to notice that's a participle. Forgetting, it's an ongoing process. Paul didn't say, I forgot what lay behind, but I'm constantly forgetting what what lay, uh, lies behind. 
most of the time when we talk about forgetting, it's kind of a negative thing, isn't it? I forgot my password. Okay. You know, they tell you not to write your passwords down. I don't get that. And if I didn't write mine down, I'd never get them. I don't, you know, because there's so many of them. You know, you've got a password for this and a password for that and a password for the other. And so forgetting is a bad thing. Forgetting where you put your keys is a bad thing. Forgetting where you parked your car is a bad thing. And don't tell me you didn't do it when you're out Christmas shopping. Okay. Forgetting somebody's birthday is a bad thing. So we usually think of forgetting as a negative, but it's not always a negative thing. Not the kind of forgetting that Paul's talking about. When Paul talks about forgetting what lies behind, he doesn't mean I don't remember it anymore. He doesn't mean it's not somewhere in my, in my consciousness. He means I don't let it affect me anymore. I don't let it change anything that I do. I don't let it guide me. What do you suppose were the things that Paul needed to forget? You see, we, we need to forget some things because they can become a drag on our spiritual growth. They can weigh us down because we're always looking back at them. And when you're always looking back at them, then you're not pressing on. So what kind of things do you suppose Paul needed to forget? I think he gives us some clues. If you look at chapter 1, verses 15 to 17, for example, Paul talks about wrongs that had been done to him by other people. He talks about that being in prison. He was in prison as he wrote this. And he says that my imprisonment has emboldened people and more people are preaching Christ. But the problem, he says, is that some are doing it out of envy. They want to inflict me in my imprisonment. They want to make this harder on me. They're glad that I'm in prison. I don't know exactly how that worked. If these were people who wanted, a, they wanted attention or they, uh, they wanted to uh, think that they were more important than they were or what. But he says somehow they rejoiced in Paul's imprisonment. And he said some preach out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but trying to afflict me in my imprisonment. But then Paul remembered that others, he said, preached from goodwill, and they did it out of love. And so he didn't let the negative preaching, if you will, the negative motives of those who were preaching, he did not let that affect him. He did not let that drag him down. He put that in the past. The other thing that I think Paul needed to forget, we read about in chapter 3, and that's his religious pedigree. And his religious accomplishments. Paul said if people want to get into some kind of boasting con uh, contest about the flesh, if they think they have reason to boast, I have more. And he begins to tell us uh, about his background uh, in Judaism. He said, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Every good Jewish male was. His parents saw to that. He said he was of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, the tribe of Benjamin, if you go back to your Old Testament, had a, had a storied history. The tribe of Benjamin was the tribe from which the very first king of Israel, Saul, came, came out of that tribe. The tribe of Benjamin were noted as skillful warriors and soldiers. And so there was a lot of honor attached to the tribe of Benjamin. It was a small tribe, one of the smallest uh, of all the 12 tribes. But it was a great tribe. It was an important tribe. And so Paul said, if people want to boast about their background, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. doesn't get any better than that. He said, I'm a Hebrew born of Hebrews. What does he mean by that? I think what he means is I'm a Hebrew born of Hebrew parents. No mixed parentage here. A full-blood Hebrew, if you will. He says, as to the law, he was a Pharisee. And remember that the Pharisees were the most meticulous keepers of the law in ancient Judaism. And Paul says, I'm one of those. I'm one of those people who doesn't let anything fall to the ground when it comes to the law. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. You know, a lot of people don't like something or some movement, and they may gripe about it, but they don't actively persecute it. But Paul said his zeal was so great that he actually persecuted the church. He said, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. That's quite a statement, isn't it? As to righteousness under the law, blameless. 
But then look what he said. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He counted it all as rubbish. Now, don't misunderstand what Paul is saying here. He's not saying that his Jewish heritage was trash. He's not saying he traded trash for the cross. He's saying he traded something very precious to him for Christ. He traded something that meant the world to him for Christ. And by comparison, it's rubbish. By comparison, it's rubbish. But he had a wonderful spiritual heritage, but he needed to put that in the background, and he had. He had forgotten that. It didn't govern his life anymore. He wasn't trying to be that zealous Pharisee anymore. He was simply trying to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Above all, he gave up that last thing that he mentions as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He gave up his reliance on the law as the standard of his righteousness. You see, Paul had always considered himself righteous because of what he had done, because of the way he had kept the law, because of his strict obedience as a Pharisee. But look at what he says in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, he says. But that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends upon faith. Paul said, I don't care about that righteousness under the law anymore. He said, what I care about now is the righteousness that God has given me because I have faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul had stopped trying to save himself by being good enough through the keeping of the law. Paul had accepted the righteousness that comes from God. He had accepted that gift of righteousness that he could never have earned for himself. So in order to press on, Paul said, I've got to forget what lies behind. He's got to forget those wrongs done to him. He's got to forget that pedigree. He's got to forget that righteousness under the law. But that's only half of it. Then he says, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Can't just get rid of the past. You've got to seek a future. And so Paul sought what lay ahead. And he uses an interesting word here when he says straining forward. This is a word that would be used of a runner in a race who's got his eyes on goal and, and he's got competition and he's straining forward with, with every muscle, every nerve, everything within him. He's straining forward to what lies ahead. And again, a participle. He didn't say, I strained once or I strain every now and then, but he says, I am straining. This is a continuous effort that he is putting forth. It is not something half-hearted or something off and on. And you and I need to take note of that because we need to understand that spiritual growth takes effort. I'm convinced that the reason that a lot of us don't grow spiritually in the way that we should is we don't want to put forth the effort. It does take effort to grow spiritually. There's nothing easy about it. When Jesus talked about a broad and easy way that leads to destruction and a narrow and hard way that leads to life, he wasn't kidding. We have to put everything else aside the way Paul did and focus uh, our efforts and our attention on that narrow way. Spiritual growth requires spiritual discipline. It requires saying yes to God and no to the gods of this world. And that's not always easy to do. That's why we've got to remember the goal. That's why we have to be sure about the goal and keep the goal clearly in view. To know what it is that we're living for. To know what it is that's so important to know what it is that's more important than anything else in the world. So Paul says to press on, he needed to forget what lay behind, and he was straining forward to what lay ahead. That's what Paul did. It's what he was advising the Philippians to do. What about you? 
If you find yourself stuck today, what about you? First of all, do you know what the goal is? Have you set the goal in your life? Is it clearly defined in your mind? Is it clear to you that nothing less than eternal life with God is what you're devoting your life to? Number two, have you given up trying to save yourself? Maybe somewhere in your past, somebody convinced you that you had to save yourself. That it was all about you and all about your effort, all about getting everything just right. Have you given that up in favor of accepting the righteousness from God that depends on faith? Number three, have you put the past in the past where it belongs? Or are you letting things that people have done in the past when they've hurt you or disappointed you, or when you've disappointed yourself, are you letting those things come up day by day and be a drag on you and pull you back and keep you from growing in the way that you, that you need to? You'll always remember those things, but have you forgotten them in the sense that you've stopped letting them rule your life? Number four, are you putting forth the effort that it takes to grow spiritually? Are you devoting yourself to prayer, devoting yourself to the study of the word, devoting yourself to staying away from the temptations of this world that would make you think that there's something better out there than Jesus? What I'm asking is, are you pressing on? And if you're not pressing on, what a great time to start as we get ready to enter into a new year. What a great time to put the past in the past and to strain forward to what lies ahead and to seek that which is the, the highest possible goal in life, to share eternity with God. Let me encourage you this morning. Don't let another year go by. Don't even let another year begin without knowing for certain that you have done that most important thing that any of us can ever do that you have put your faith in Christ in order to receive that righteousness from God. And you've been baptized into his death so that you can rise to newness of life with him. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know whether you are stuck or whether you are growing or whether you have been declining. But whatever you do and wherever you are, press on. Press on. Let's stand together and sing. I must needs go home.